Today's youth need teachers, volunteers, and most of all, well, they need you. I'm Doug Edwards, and I'm going to be talking with real youth mentors and students to give you the knowledge you need to be the best youth worker possible. This is Youth Worker on Fire. Hey, Youth Worker Nation, this is Doug Edwards, and I am happy to have on Youth Worker on Fire today one of my good friends. Jim is one of the ultimate volunteers. Not only did he volunteer for me, but he volunteered for his community, Rotary Club, and uh, knocked it out of the park so many times for this community and a lot of people. So but Jim volunteered for me for more than 20 years because volunteers go through a lot. Jim came down from Detroit, grew up in Detroit, Michigan, a uh, real Michigan fan still to this day. Go um, Blue. Uh, go Blue. He's also got a picture of him and his son, John, with Tom Brady. Go Pats. That? That's right. They moved down here. Your middle school years or high school years? Uh, we actually came to Florida my middle school years. Middle school years. He was used to high school, was an athlete, started business shortly after high school, married the girl of his dreams, who became the woman of his dreams. and Prin uh, The principal's daughter. The principal's daughter. That was a tall order, and uh, Jim was up for it. And so uh, he's got three kids. His business is Tip Tops of America and uh, had that business for many, many years. National, if you want T-shirts, you know, go to this guy and, and order those things because Jim is a giver and not only has volunteered, but he's given to a lot of people. He's got three children and we're going to let you talk a little bit about them. You got John, Michael and Rebecca and his beautiful wife, Marilyn. Jim, catch us up a little bit. Tell us where, where life has been from then until now. And I came to Eustis in 1971. I graduated from Eustis High School in 1975. I was one of those guys that I wanted to do something I had no clue as to what I was gonna do, none. And so I kind of bounced around from job to job. Meanwhile, my girlfriend then, future wife, was going to UCF. I worked at UPS, I worked at a lot of different places and decided I wanted to do something for myself. Uh, I was fairly creative, art was kind of a passion of mine. And so uh, when she graduated from college, uh, she went to work in Apopka as a teacher. She didn't really like it that much. So we decided we would start our own business. Boy, was that a mistake. <laughs> uh, you know, we had no experience, no know-how. No money. So well, the good news was we didn't have anything to lose. Yes. And we just gutted it out. Uh, basically, I don't think we made a penny for the first three years. And Sounds like real business. No, it, was, it, was, it was lovely. Yeah. It, uh, it almost destroyed us, our marriage, everything about us. But somehow we pulled through. And um, during that process, the hard process, uh, I had a motorcycle accident on top of everything else. And I was laid up for quite a while. And I can remember my uh, first real face-to-face -face with my mortality was after the motorcycle accident. And I was in the room. I, I had had the motorcycle accident early in the morning. They brought me to Waterman, then they transferred me to LRMC. And I had surgery, I had a really banged up leg and foot. I can remember it was, it was at night about eight o'clock. Uh, it had been a long day. I had been through my first surgery and the doctor came in and he said, well, we made it through the first surgery. He said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, Doug. I hope we can save your foot. And I thought, well, yeah. I hope you can too. <laughs> yeah. that, that's something uh, you'll remember, right? But uh, when everybody left that night and the room was dark, God started to talk to me. And the reality was, is that Jesus had been talking to me for a while and I just wasn't listening. <laughs> he needed to get my attention. And it was really at that point uh, that the genesis of my real faith started to begin. Mm -hmm. From there, uh, my wife at the time was the spiritual leader of, of our family. She had been in church her whole life, and I had not. And she insisted we go to church together. And so I went to church. I started going to church at the uh, Presbyterian Church. And then um, she said, there's this new church called Trinity, and we need to go there, because she said, I want to. And I said, okay. 
So we went over there, and I sat in the back with my arms folded for quite a while, not doing anything, just observing and not really knowing what I was supposed to do, not really happy being there. I was kind of angry at that time. It was just, it was a hard time for me. Then one day, uh, something clicked, and I just, the lights started to go on. We were sponsoring a family from Russia, and I got involved with that family. And uh, I started to meet friends at the church. And I, and I got to tell you, meeting people at church, meeting the friends, making the connections, different kinds of connections and different kinds of friends was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was a life changer for me. It showed me a different kind of lifestyle. It showed me um, a different kind of joy. And I was able to start to really embrace that as I started to move forward with my faith. And every day my faith was becoming more and more real. And when that happens, God starts to challenge you. He starts to give you things that are beyond your scope, but just maybe you can, you can do some things. And one of the things that I did was I got involved with you. I met you and your lovely wife and family, and, and I got involved with you uh, teaching Sunday school for the senior highs with a friend of mine named John Harrison. And we started off in basically a closet with a bunch of angry teenagers. Yes. And uh, it really started to grow. You know, I don't know if they were getting anything, but I was being filled up tremendously. I was loving it, and it was really helping me grow. And then some other things came along. We had some needs at the church. I was, uh, I was with my friend John, and he was telling me about some of these needs at the church because at that point, I was out of the political sphere of, you know, what Trinity was. I was just going to church and soaking up Jesus. I learned about all these challenges that we had space-wise, and we didn't have enough room for Sunday school. And, and for the first time in my life, I call it a bright thought. There was this humongous bright thought that came into my brain that said, you're the guy who's going to take on this challenge of the space. Now, Doug, you know me. I, yeah. know, I have no construction experience. Mm -hmm. I right. had no fundraising experience at that time. Mm -hmm. I had no experience in anything, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. You know, school of hard knocks. Mm -hmm. And within a month, I was in front of the church talking about raising money for a million-dollar facility at Trinity. And that could only happen with Jesus Christ. Yeah. I wouldn't conceive that. I wouldn't take on that. I wasn't motivated to do that. And the overriding feeling that I had during the whole process that, that first year or two was unmitigated terror. Mm -hmm. I was just absolutely terrified. I had to get up in front of people, which I had never done before. I had to speak publicly, which I had never done before. Mm -hmm. I had to be clever, which well, I'd been clever before. Yes, but, you have. <laughs> but just letting that manifest itself mm -hmm. in the way that Jesus Christ wanted to manifest itself and to have it be a success along with the youth stuff that I was doing was, um, was really, really eye-opening for me. Ten years later, we had the, uh, we had the building. It was built. That building has now paid off. Uh, it's been a wonderful facility. I'm still involved with Trinity. I'm on the servant board now. And I'm a substitute adult teacher over there. I also do a couple of men's Bible studies over there. Mm -hmm. So I'm still plugged in. I'm still plugged in with you, my good friend. Mm -hmm. we, have, we meet and have lunch every week. That's and, right. Um, That's right. You know, uh, it's just Jesus in my life changed everything for the better. Yeah, and you grew up uh, in quite a tough atmosphere. Grew up with uh, a divorce situation, remarriage with, with on both of your parents' part. And so that's difficult in any child. We didn't talk about that. Why in the world d did you volunteer the way you did? Jim, you had more than enough to do. You had a business that takes every waking moment. Anyone who's an entrepreneur or a business owner knows that if you own the business, it never leaves you. It's with you even when you're off. And you're never totally off uh, physically from it, but uh, or mentally at least. And so, and your family needs you. You have three children. You have uh, Michael, who's a, a child of great need, and 24 years of age now, right. wheelchair bound, but smiles and and loves you guys and knows that uh, you love him. And then John, who just got married, Rebecca, who's in college and and uh, working on her career right now. So when they were young. You were doing all these things, and even when they got older, you were volunteering. Tell me what it feels like to be a volunteer, whether with Rotary, a volunteer with, with your church, with student ministries of all things, something that you 
had not been a part of before. You probably had never been in a church with student ministries before growing up. All right. You know, we went, we were a family that uh, when I was growing up, we went on uh, sometimes Christmas Eve, most of the time Easter. Yeah. And uh, the rest of the time, uh, we didn't really go. You know, I knew there was a God and all of that stuff. But when I started going to church regularly and I actually started listening to the sermons and I started reading the Bible, which I would encourage everybody to do, it's yeah. really a good book. I realized that there was a call from God, go and make disciples, make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the Great Commission. And so uh, when I understood um, what I was reading and it was explained to me what all that meant, uh, I made the conscious decision to try and say yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when God asked to say yes. Now, there's no physical way you can say yes in life to everything. You should try to say yes to the important things. Mm -hmm. And when God calls, that's pretty important in my opinion. I just, tried to, just started to try and say yes. And I figured God would help me work out my schedule and work out the other stuff. And my wife was uh, very supportive uh, that I was involved in the church. And I got to say, if there's a Christian woman out there and she doesn't want her husband involved in church, they, you know, they need to reevaluate some things because it's just so good for men to be involved in church. It's so good for men to be an influence, especially in young people's lives. Uh, many times, young people are missing that, that man influence. I think that there's, there's real biblical prophecy in that uh, as far as your role as a man. And so I took that seriously, and I just tried to say yes when I could. But you're the ultimate yes. I mean, we had a few that lasted a long time. The average volunteer lasts anywhere from a year to 18 months, maybe two years. We had multiples that lasted uh, 5, 10, 20, 25 years of a 29-year stint there that I was at that church. So how do you do this year after year after year? Now, I know the standard answer is, is God, but let's, let's look at a mental and physical approach to that as well. How hard was that on you physically some days? Well, you know, I'm a glutton for punishment, Doug. Yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> um, type of people I picked out. <laughs> there, there, were, there were times when um, I was really struggling. I did Sunday school for, what, 15 years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of that, I'd kind of run out of gas. Uh, yeah. And I felt like uh, as I was getting older, uh, I know the camera doesn't show up, but I'm just like, I'm not 25 anymore. I know. As I got older, I felt Try like maybe they older. needed a fresh voice. Mm -hmm. um, there were some things there that I just wanted a different role. And I think when you're volunteering, uh, that's important to have a different role, to not be stuck in the same thing so you can re-challenge yourself over and over and over again. You know, I used to love the, the trips that we went on and, and meeting the new students. That was always uh, mm -hmm. good and bad, and we had both. Um, yeah. But I think just changing it up, I think, you know, changing it up was, was really important to me. Um, trying to not do the same thing every year. A few years, I, I volunteered for vacation Bible study and did some young kids stuff and just change. You know, mm -hmm. I think that uh, if you don't change, if you're not willing to change, it gets really monotonous. It's easy to get burned out. Yeah. And the students yeah. sense that. Or anybody, adults, mm -hmm. if you're in an adult ministry, they sense it too. And uh, boredom is not a tool for growth. <laughs> so no, no. Uh, changing it up was how I kind of dealt with it. And sometimes just saying, you know, there were plenty of times when I was mm -hmm. like, I don't want to do this. I don't yeah. want to go there. I don't want to do Absolutely. this. But when I did, I was blessed. And that thought was always in my mind. The more I don't want to do it, I think, wow, there's probably more of a blessing coming than I really, mm -hmm. really understand. And nine times out of 10, that's what happened. I would not want to go on an event with you or I'd want to skip out on this one. And then I'd go and I'd be blessed. Mm -hmm. And that blessing is what recharges you, Doug. Yeah. You know, that blessing from a student or a blessing from the word of God or a blessing from somebody that you met that you didn't know you were going to meet or some circumstance and that you carry that with you. That becomes part of your memory bank. And it, when you're low, you can go to that memory bank and fill up a little mm -hmm. bit. And mm -hmm. I used to do that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And once again, though, 15 years as a volunteer, not getting paid for, for any of those things, having to pay out money. A lot of times yeah, I, didn't when we like did the, that. I didn't like that part <laughs> at all. <laughs> right. When we did those trips, in fact, the board started feeling so bad, they started trying to pay all of my staff's ways because of your place long term. Number one, you need if you can stay somewhere long term, you get to see growth. You get to see these things happen. 
and you and people start trusting you if you're trustworthy. If you're trustworthy with money, if you're trustworthy with their students, if you're trustworthy with their their staff and uh, your the church or the organization you're with. You know, if you're not with a church and you're with another organization community, integrity and character are still a major component. And when people see integrity and character and results they are willing to jump on board the big train that's moving. And uh, that's what happened in our case. They saw the sacrifices of, of you volunteers, and, and they started getting embarrassed. <laughs> they started going, we can't let these guys pay for these things all the time. It's taken from their family. The, you know, this program is moving like a freight train, like a 747 airplane, and, and we've got to do something to help these guys out because it's too important. When other people see the importance, it's it's because of guys like you that put value to it. I used to observe. I didn't know how to observe completely. It mainly I was taught, you know, go get volunteers and kind of interview them or whatever. But I would actually watch people sometimes for, for a year to two years before I'd even approach them and ask them. And then I found out from a guy by the name of Dave Ramsey hiring his own staff because of the, some of the bad things he had happen. They now do 14 to 17 interviews of the same person yeah. before they Google hire. does that too. Yeah, do they really? Mm -hmm. Wow. And so uh, I can't imagine that. I've never done that, but I did observe for a year to two years before we'd ask. And the, the people that I observed uh, lasted the longest. Well, you know, Doug, the other thing that was really important to me was, um, and what kept me going, for instance, I, I left teaching Sunday school and I was kind of on the sidelines for six or seven months. And then we started, then I started doing the Monday night thing with you. And I did that for another 10 years, but really it was the relationships, the relationships with the students, the other staff. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the, some of the staff that we had that came and went, they ended up being some of my closest friends Absolutely. in life, you know, yeah. and um, life is all about relationships. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's your relationship with Christ and then your relationship with your wife, your children, your friends and family, the people that you, you come in contact with on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, the relationships really helped sustain me. We had a lot of fun. Even when things were tough, there were still a lot of laughs. Mm -hmm. We were able to laugh at ourselves, yes. laugh at each other, <laughs> laugh at the students. <laughs> yeah, right. We, we, had, we had a lot of fun. We're going to talk a little bit about Colorado. Jim is a great... Uh, snow skier has done it for years. Tell me your worst volunteer moment that you can tell, and it could be with Rotary or it could be oh, with my, us. Well, my my worst volunteer my worst volunteer moment was when we lost the kid in Washington D.C. Uh, no, that was <laughs> that, my worst. No, well, that was my worst moment. <laughs> that was my. You know, we're in Washington D.C. Yeah. We're on a tour. We've got fifty to sixty kids with us, and one of them comes up missing. Yeah, and we don't know where he is. And Washington, D.C. is a crowded place in the summer. Mm -hmm. And so for an hour there, uh, and what this is why it was worse for me. I was assigned not to look for the kid. I was assigned to oversee the rest of the kids. And so I didn't know what was going on. And when I don't know what's going on, that's bad for me. I like to know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of freaking out and trying to put on a happy face for everybody else. And we were heading towards Arlington, which is across the river, which is further away from not my favorite moment as a volunteer. Um, I, you know, seeing some kids get hurt on the mountain from time to time or kids that got out there and they didn't do what we said to do, preparing to get out to Colorado and mm -hmm. they would get altitude sickness or something. That was, that was not fun either. We had very, very few, but a couple of kids that just were there for the wrong reasons and you mm -hmm. would have to deal with them. Right. Um, that was always a challenge, mm -hmm. but we made it through and, yeah. you know, God was good. And uh, yeah, there are very few. And the reason there, there are very few is because we learned a couple of lessons and I learned it from another group on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was always make sure that beginners take a lesson. Mm -hmm. Don't take for granted that they know how to ski or snowboard. No matter what they say. No matter what they say. Because uh, they're liars. That's right. <laughs> and the second thing is make them all wear a helmet. Uh, we had to be responsible for those other kids. And I knew how clumsy I was. I cracked uh, a couple of helmets. <laughs> and uh, Doug, was, so, Doug was fun. You were fun to watch. Let's just say that. You, were, you, were, you gave me a lot of joy. It was a work in prog you progress. You gave me a lot of joy on the mountain watching you ski, Doug. <laughs>
were with uh, our mutual friend, Coach Clark Blake, and, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he brought up Doc Glenn, and I skied yeah. with Doc. Doc was, he learned to ski at age 70 uh, or 72, somewhere in there. Doc was a pretty good skier. I think he's better than me. So he hit some powder there in Colorado. And my thing is, you know, if you're not falling, you're not learning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't subscribe to that philosophy. <laughs> That's right. And I got tired of that. <laughs> and so uh, Doc Glenn told Clark later, he says, you know, that Doug, he falls a lot. <laughs> and so I, I had to stop that. In yeah. fact, the worst fall was when I got tired of you guys skiing better than me. So I had already made a couple of runs and I was going full blast and I hit that piece of ice. And I flew, I don't even know what it looked like, but you guys said it, it was, looked like the cartoon. It was gorgeous. <laughs> it was truly <laughs> spectacular. As fast as it you can on a Colorado It was art in motion. Mountain. That's what it was. <laughs> I'm surprised you had any clothes left on after that yard sale. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a painful Things were uh, flying everywhere. art it in was, motion. It was lovely. Painful art. It was lovely. But the other thing out there, it wasn't just... You know, I mean, we would tell the kids, you know, make sure you hydrate. They wouldn't hydrate. Make sure you use sunscreen. Remember the guy that we said, please use sunscreen? Yeah, Tim. And then uh, he didn't. That was bad. You know, I've never seen a blister that big mm -hmm. in my life, but I understand that he survived and lived to tell the story. Yeah, Tim, Tim's a great kid. Yeah. You did these volunteer things. Tell me about your best moment as a volunteer, if there's one moment. There were lots of really, really great, I would say they're better than great, they're special moments where uh, you have a person one-on-one -on -one and they start to really tell you about their life and you realize that these are problems that are bigger than just kid problems and these are issues that can be lifelong issues that they would have to deal with and you have a chance to listen to them and to let them know that you really love them and you really care about them, that there are answers to some of those questions. And they may not be looking in the right place, so you you have the opportunity to give them some direction. And all of that comes from training that we had. Uh, you don't just come up with that stuff off the top of your head. Those moments uh, with those students paid dividends over the years. And I, I have to tell you, I'm not done with those moments Students that we went on trips 10, 15 years ago will contact me on Facebook or text me or email me and say, hey, you know, I was thinking about you, this happened, and they have kids now, and they're going through things, and just that 10 or 15 years later, somebody thinks about a moment or a time or a season that we had together, and they think enough about it to come back and say, hey, that was meaningful to me, that really helped me. Those are still happening, and those are the best moments. Yeah. And one thing that I was taught years ago and that I tried to pass on to you guys was that sometimes it'll be years before you hear one great comment of, because you said, because you did, my life has changed. Yeah, it's and, impressive. Yeah, and so those of you who don't volunteer long enough or you, or you don't stay and look at you, and by the way, it's a marathon. In fact, it's not even a marathon. It's an ultra marathon. I learned about ultra marathons and they make marathons look like a walk in a park. Mm -hmm. And so, but they are ultra marathons to where you can't say this about this one event. It's about this one moment. It's not. It's about the uh, compounding of moments. The retreats were about compounding right. in a saturated situation moments that you could that would take you months and years to develop without a retreat. We did the volunteer retreats on a regular basis for those mm -hmm. of you guys, whether you're teachers in the public school or coaches, you're t if you got a team or you're administrators, you need retreats even for those guys because it's a condensed form of time that's pressurized in a good way right. to where you get to care about each other. We do some training, but we do some playing. The yeah, first, lots, lots of fun. There's lots of fun you in have volunteer. To have fun. If you're not having fun volunteering, then you're either with the wrong people or you're volunteering for the wrong thing because volunteering by definition has a lot of fun in it. Great relationships. So, you know, and we had other kinds of great moments, not just those one-on-one -on -one things, but I mean, the year we were at DCLA and, and Mel Gibson came out on stage. That was a great moment. I mean, there was, a, there was a presence in that building at that time that, you know, just things like that, that you, stories you can tell and, 
you know, moments that you can share, and it, it really helped grow our youth program. And there were lots of good moments, lots of fun things on trips, that lots of stories that I'll cherish forever. Yeah, and they, they were life-changing events, yes. and they, they were for me as for well. Me. As a volunteer, you, you want to hook up with those organizations that will that are tried and true or that you see are developing in a good way, unless you know that you can be a part of something that is growing or just starting to grow. And, and that's like an investment. You don't know what's going to happen to those groups, but that's okay. okay. And, and I would but if say, you're not wanting to grow something, then get a, to be a part of an organization. Uh, and that I, will and help I would you say train. this if you're part of an organization or you're part of a church, that church needs volunteers for something. Absolutely. So find out what your spiritual gift is, what your niche is, what you're good at, and share it. Yes. And, and age doesn't matter. Jim I and keep I, saying that. Jim and I were very young. <laughs> Jim and I were very young when we started doing the these programs and we grew older with the program but I found out from one of the best youth workers in the nation and I've seen this in the teaching field as well mm -hmm. it is not a matter of age it is a matter of heart and if they have heart and compassion for for students then there is no age limit uh, and sometimes a 70 year old is more energetic than a 20 year old uh, and sometimes you get those but you have to be careful you have to to observe you have to test and let them try things out and I love what uh, the principal of this school said Nancy Velez she says uh, there's always room for everyone who wants to volunteer it may not be what they wanted originally they might may not be capable of volunteering in some certain areas but there's always a place Jim, tell me about your family. Cole, let's talk about Michael and his situation. Because, guys, you've heard this volunteer talk about all of his years with us, all the things, all the trips that we did. Three children, eventually his children end up going on those trips. Michael is the middle child. Give us a little story about Michael. Michael was born um, February 1st, 2003. Perfectly normal, healthy baby, lovely kid. At six months, he had his first seizure. Uh, we weren't sure what it was. Um, emergency room trip, lots of panics, fear, scaring, prayers, all of that stuff. The doctor said it's probably just a febrile seizure, which means he spiked a fever and it caused a seizure. So we were encouraged by that. And that was like in September. Thanksgiving, he had another seizure. We started to become concerned. We got in touch with the neurologist in Orlando, went through some testing. They didn't know what it was. We ended up going to Shands at the University of Florida. As he was getting older, he was a year now, two years, he started to walk. It's a little slower walking, but you know, still, and he had kind of an unusual gait, but <clears throat> he could get around and he loved to run. But unfortunately, his seizures were continuing to develop. We were concerned at trying to figure it out. Uh, we went to University of Florida, the pediatric neurologist, the head of pediatric neurology was Dr. Maria, and he was a, a brilliant guy but he didn't have a clue. So we ended up uh, taking Michael out of the country to Nova Scotia to a doctor named Dr. Peter Canfield up there who was um, a specialist with seizures in young children. When we got there, we didn't get good news. We mm -hmm. didn't, uh, Dr. Canfield <clears throat> diagnosed Michael with what had been a fairly new diagnosis in the pediatric field. It was called Dravet's syndrome. And it's a seizure disorder that is not focal, it's, it's diffuse, which means the seizures start anywhere in the brain, not one specific area that you can pinpoint, and they had no cure for it. So we came back to Eustis, Florida, and um, they sent us a pamphlet in the, um, in the mail with a bunch of paperwork and big envelope full of stuff, and we started reading it. And um, probably my worst, my, probably my worst day was the day I got all that paperwork because it said... Um, all the kids that had been diagnosed with this, they died in their teens. Mm. And mm. Uh, their development suffered as they got older. Now, Michael had been, he could sing. He, he was in Awana at church. He was, by this time, you know, he's singing, talking, running around like any normal kid, still having seizures, but we didn't see any development issues, really. And we read that, and it was, oh, yeah. it was really heartbreaking. And then um, we didn't notice anything till he was about four and a half. And he used to love to say the blessing at dinner. He would, you know, God is great, God is good. And, and we're sitting at dinner one night, and he goes to say the blessing. And he gets to the end, and he can't remember the last couple of words. Mm. And Marilyn and I looked at each other, and I think we both, we didn't say it, but we both knew 
this this was different. This would this could be the start of this. So um, the good news is is that Michael did not die in his teens. Michael is alive and well today. Mm -hmm. Michael is 24 years old. Yes. Michael is the best minister in our family. Mm -hmm. He can't talk. He can't walk. He gets fed through a feeding tube, but he is absolutely the best, most powerful spirit in our family. Mm -hmm. He ministers to people in ways that I will never be able to minister to. And the other thing is, is our family is different because of his blessing. Yeah. You know, for some reason, God chose Marilyn and I came along for the ride. <laughs> and what a blessing this kid has been to us. Mm -hmm. People on the outside so many times have said, how can you love a God that would do this to your kid? God didn't do this to Michael. Michael's a, a part of a sinful world, you know, mm -hmm. as a result of a world that has disease and things that happen and they just happen. But what God has done with him and taken him and made him such a, a positive influence is just, it's amazing to me. It's, it's the miracle that I have witnessed. And um, my other children are different because of him too. Yes. You know, my, my oldest son, John, who's a fabulous kid, you know, he's high tech job, all of that good stuff. Really, really good guy. Just got married. He wanted Michael as his best man. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to tell you, it broke my heart. You know, it's yeah. just really powerful moment when Michael was the best man at his wedding. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it's stuff you just can't make up. It's stuff that's, that's God stuff that just keeps happening. And I just keep being blessed over and over and over. And Rebecca, she's the, she's the baby of the family, but she really turned out to be Michael's big brother. She cared for him so much when mm -hmm. he was growing up. Mm -hmm. And she sacrificed. Both my kids have sacrificed. They know what sacrifice is. Yeah. Because of Michael's condition. And they did it lovingly and willingly. Now, you know, their kids, is it 100% of the time? Are they joyous that we can't go on the ski trip? Well, mm -hmm. no, but they understand the importance of uh, taking care of their brother. You know, Michael was like my worst moment and my best moment all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And God has revealed himself to me in so many ways through Michael's life. Who knows? I mean, who knows what's left for that kid? Rebecca got up one, this was a few years ago, they did an article in, in the local paper about Michael and the local Channel 2 picked it up. A couple of days later, Rebecca comes into the living room and she goes, Emmy, her friend who lives in Amsterdam, says Michael is on the front page of their newspaper wow. because somebody had picked it up and then PBS picked it up and then Reuters picked it up. And so the influence... Mm -hmm. And the way that God uses people, the way he's used me, the way he's used you, Doug, the way he's used Michael, we don't know his ways. We mm -hmm. just have to keep trying to say yes. And, and yes is a, is a great word. No is a great word because you have to say no so you can say more of the yeses to the right, right things. And, and the biggest yeses are to your family, always right. to the family, family, God first, faith, family, and friends, and that order uh, your family needs to know that they are above your volunteerism, by the way, volunteers. Yeah, well, while I was out doing all the volunteer stuff, Marilyn was home taking care of Michael, taking care of the other two kids, making sure everything ran. So I had the opportunity to do. She I believed the, in what we were doing. She believed in you. Totally yeah. support. She's the real hero. Now, mm -hmm. you know, I'm here doing the interview. She should be here doing the interview. You need to interview her, Doug. Well, you know, I've, I've already talked to her Good. about that. We're going to do that. We'll do it with Michael Because her testimony is powerful. Yeah. And uh, so there's no question about it. Um, we are a family. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is done alone. And at the head of our family is Jesus Christ. You know, mm -hmm. uh, once we keep the priorities right, we should be able to get through any rough spots and bumps and bruises that uh, we come across. Absolutely. Well, Jim, tell uh, everyone how they can get in touch with you, how they can get in touch with your company if they want to do that, and how they can get in touch with you personally. Yeah, my company is uh, Tip Tops of America Incorporated. We uh, do screen printing and embroidery. We've, we've been doing it for 36 years. So if you have an event, you need something, give us a call. Um, we have a number. 352-357-9559. We have a website, tiptops.com. And if you want to contact me, uh, my email is jim at tiptops.com. Jim at tiptops.com. And Youth Worker Nation, if you want to know about volunteerism, you want to see the ins and outs, there's a whole lot more that Jim has to say. Volunteers want to know how hard it's going to be and what we've learned as we tell them 
that it's going to be harder than it really is. It's hard. That's right. And if you tell volunteers that it's not hard, then you're lying to them and they don't last. That's and, and, why they don't last. And if you're a volunteer for youth, particularly boy youth, it's stinky too. It's yes. really, it's, the smells are bad. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying, if you're retreating, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Traveling in a vehicle. All right, Jim, any, any parting comments I for just, us? I just want to thank you, Doug, for all you've done for me. I feel honored to be here uh, being interviewed by you. You're a, you're a giant in my life, a tremendous influence, positive thank influence. You. And I just wanted you to know that. I want the world to know that. All right, guys, we're out. Youth Worker Nation. Remember, you can get us on uh, Google Play as well as iTunes and Stitcher. And we have some of our episodes on YouTube. They will all be on YouTube eventually. If you want to be one of the advertisers or sponsors, you can do that. So reach out to us at youthworkeronfire at gmail.com. You've been listening to the Youth Worker on Fire podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and tell your friends. Also, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Stay tuned for more informative episodes.